Well, I want to welcome you all to um, What the World Needs Now. And this is our first time ever doing this. And I have my, my man, Josh Monroe, with me. And we're just a couple of passionate educators uh, in the heartland of uh, the U.S. And we want to share our stories with the world. And we are going to have some incredible, incredible educators join us over the next few weeks and months. So um, we're just going to talk about what we do in our classrooms to keep inspired and inspire the students that we touch uh, base with every single day. And hopefully, if you like this, you keep listening and keep watching. And if you love it, then share the word. So, um, <laughs> like I said, my name is Tom Wisnant. I teach fourth grade um, in Omaha, Nebraska. And um, I love it. It's absolutely amazing. I was named the 2019 Sanford Teacher Award Grand Prize winner. Um, and it was just the most incredible experience ever. And um, I just want to share that with, with anybody I can. And Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, and so I'm Josh Monroe. I teach fifth grade in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, this is my ninth year of teaching. And something kind of unique is that I, I teach at the school that I grew up going to. Uh, and so I get, a, I get to bring a unique perspective to, to my school and to my classroom because uh, I'm walking through the same things that my kids did. So. Um, but yeah, uh, like Tom was saying, we're excited. We're excited to share our stories. We're excited to get other people on here with us and have them share their stories and, and hopefully light that spark when it, when it's running a little low. So Tom, you mentioned, you mentioned the Sanford Harmony. Tell a little bit more about that because yeah. I think that that story is awesome. Well, that's, it's really incredible. Great teachers for a long time have really understood the value of building classroom community and giving children the skills that they need to be successful, not just in the classroom, but throughout their life. And for the first about 10 years of teaching, I was always scrambling to find literature, trade books to give lessons or uh, come up with fun activities. I was scouring the web. And before that, you know, I'd beg, borrow and steal anything I could from any great educator <laughs> to engage kids. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I feel you. Um, so um, I just had the fortune one day of um, getting notified about this curriculum called Sanford Harmony and it's 100% free, it's available online, and what it, deal, what it does is deal with the social emotional learning that should be taking place and does take place in great classrooms across America, across the world, and um, I was able to get a hold of that and start using it in my classroom, and then um, encourage other teachers in my school to use it, and encourage other teachers in the district I teach in, Millard in Omaha, uh, Miller Public Schools to start using it and um, it's just an absolutely amazing curriculum. I was able to speak to the Nebraska State Education Association about it and uh, get some teachers from there excited about social emotional learning and um, I've just seen the power of it in my classroom and it's nice to be able to not have to worry about where the social emotional lessons are coming from or where the social emotional activities are coming from and then to be able to tie back um, the cooperative learning that goes on in my classroom to this curriculum and have a common language, not just in my classroom, but in the school and across some of the district as well. Um, it's just really, really powerful. So that's my, uh, my involvement with Sanford Harmony. And um, I got nominated for this Sanford Teacher Award. And it's just been an absolute thrill to, uh, to be associated with that. And um, that's, that's the yeah, Sanford what an, story. What an honor. Uh, you know, and you're, you're part of the inspiration of why I use it in my classroom. And man, you, you hit it out of the park when you said, it's got everything there for you. Because as teachers, you know how much time we're spending planning. And this cuts down on that plan time for you. And I think one of the great things that I've learned from it, and, and I think that it takes teachers a long time to learn this, is when we hear social emotional learning, we think that that has to be a block of time set apart every day, but you can blend it in so easily with Sanford Harmony. Um, you learn how to, to weave it into your math class or your reading class. Just everything you're doing is social emotional learning. Yeah. Um, I see you on Instagram and I see you on Facebook and Twitter and Josh, something I really admire about you is how you do have your kids collaborate like 
all the time and you do implement social emotional learning like you have kids i just saw you the other day put on um you know you take five minutes before a test or some exam to meditate to be mindful to relax i think that's yeah. fantastic and, and you're weaving it into instruction and it's not a standalone you know yeah awesome. and uh in case we in case we need a sponsorship we'll, we'll throw out the call map there teachers the call map is free for educators go ahead and download that and sign up for for calm today <laughs> yeah I love, <laughs> it. I love it josh tell us about um so social emotional learning is really important and we engage kids through that all the time but another thing that you do that is absolutely i think incredible is your use of TikTok and creating these short TikTok videos to inspire not just kids, but really educators all over the world. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how, how you came to do that and how, yeah. how you have your guest sponsor or guest, guest host, your dog, involved in some of this. Yeah, so uh, TikTok, TikTok's something I used to make, not make fun of, I, I would tease my kids about on, uh, do you guys do Friday fun? Like Friday extra recess kind of a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little time to relax yeah. on Fridays. Yeah. Uh, and so during ours, a lot, of the, a lot of the kids would start making TikToks and stuff. And I'd, I'd give them a hard time about it. But then once crisis learning came, um, I got desperate on how, how can I keep them engaged? How can I get them back to, to the next Zoom meeting when they don't have to be there? So I turned to TikTok and I started making goofy videos of me dancing. And I'm not a dancer at all. Um, I had Nala, uh, so Nala's a therapy dog in my classroom, and I had Nala in on the videos, uh, and, and it, was, it was all just for fun to start, and it, and it still is, um, but then it kind of grew a little bit more. Um, I woke up one day and had like 5,000 followers. The next day, I had 10,000. Eventually, I got up to 27,000, and then when I sat, I was, I was flipping through videos one time, and, and I saw this other teacher make a video and it was uh it was a kid sleeping and so it, so it was called a point of view video so you're you're seeing the teacher as the student and he walks over and pounds on the desk and says hey you're tired i'm tired we're all tired it's time to get back to work and so i made this video that that was trying to explain that teachers need to come from a, a place of empathy no matter what what situation we're walking into. And it was just a video of me walking up saying, hey buddy, um, I noticed you're tired. Can you, can you tell me a little bit more about that? But you're starting to get the student side from it then. And it's not, it's not this discipline you're trying to place upon the kid. I made that video. I woke up the next day with over 100,000 notifications. I, I was up at 120,000 followers. I mean, it was, it was unreal. And so then I just started making videos um, towards teaching and hey here's what I do in my classroom here's here's ways that you can approach different situations uh, so yeah it was it was a bit of a whirlwind there because I mean I was just I was just doing it for fun just to get kids on zooms and then all of a sudden I had this huge following asking me what do you do in your classroom how, how would you do this uh, so it, it was it was cool um, it's fun that's awesome different. <laughs> that is it's way cool. Definitely different. Yeah, yeah. What a what a great way to inspire. Like, and it's clear, yeah, 120,000 notifications. It's a huge inspiration to people. That's incredible, Josh. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, and when I when I reflect back on it, the thing that I think is, I guess I don't know the right word. The the strangest out of all of it is was this was just to get kids into a zoom meeting. And now, now I'm making videos for teachers about, Hey, what would you do if this was happening in your classroom? Um, and so it's fun to put out because all of mine, all of my videos have been about social emotional learning, approaching teaching with empathy. It's fun to share that with other people. It's been, it's been a gift. Why do you think, do obviously people are connecting, like they're connecting big time with this. Why do you think, why do you think they're connecting so much with empathy? specifically in your videos, Josh? Oh, <laughs> so it's hard to read through all of the comments that come on to, to each video. Um, some of them have like 12,000 comments, but I do, I do my best to read through them. And I've, I've heard some really heartbreaking stories 
and I've heard some great stories about teachers too, but I think that, I think that people are connecting the most because they can relate to that video that I'm making. So you, they're relating to that kid in one way or another, in a good way or a bad way. This is how my teacher was, or unfortunately, this is not how my teacher was. Um, and so I, I think that they see themselves, whether they're a teacher or not, they see themselves in that video um, and they're just making a connection with it. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's awesome. So you're obviously an inspiration. Where do you find this inspiration? Like, how do you keep yourself going? Right. You, you create these videos, you're, you're creative, you do it, but what is the, like, what is the spark that, that you keep going back to that drives you? Trying to surround myself with like-minded people like yourself. Um, I want to be, I want to be around people that care about teaching as much as I do. Um, a lot of what I think back to is uh, Tom Henry, who was, he was my fourth grade teacher and I now teach with him in fifth grade. He, uh, he's the one that turned me towards teaching. So, I mean, where I keep, I keep going back to how, how do we want kids to leave our classroom each day feeling? And I mean, we want them to feel loved. We want them to leave feeling inspired. We want them to feel leaving valued. And so that's really where I go to, not just in TikTok, but in every part of my career is how do I want a kid to feel when they leave class? So, yeah, but I mean, other than, other than that, I do a, I do a lot of reading. Um, actually, you, you turned me on to the book Permission to Feel. Uh, I, that's been a big part of my, my class this year. I read it over the summer, but I'm, uh, I've started incorporating a lot of what I read in that book in there. Um, yeah, reading's, reading's a big part of what I do too. Yeah, absolutely. Continuing your professional development. That's awesome. Right. Mm. Right. And, and man, what a great book. I'm, I'm so glad that you turned me to that. You turned me to that. You turned me to, uh, inspire. Um, great books, but I mean, you use, you use that stuff in your classroom too, permission to feel, especially, um, talk I mean, about that a little bit. Cause I don't think a lot of teachers know about this book yet and it's a great book. We got to get that out to people. Yeah. So, um, I was lucky enough that when, uh, I won this social emotional, um, award from Sanford inspire and Sanford harmony from national university, um, I really started digging into social emotional learning and what it looks like and, and really what it is. And there's a guy by the name of Mark Brackett from Yale University that is just spot on with everything having to do with social emotional learning, social emotional well being uh, for both children and adults. And it is just the absolutely most incredible book I think professionally I've read. Um, so it just goes into, um, about how social emotional skills are just that skills. We address academic skills in school, but do we really take the time, not just for kids, but as adults to honor how we feel? It goes into being a, uh, an emotional detective and really asking the questions about this behavior that I'm seeing, this emotion that's coming out of this student, um, where does that come from? And then my reaction as an adult, where does that come from? And just taking a moment, and relaxing, thinking about that before we react, before we head to a punitive punishment, what, what is this behavior really showing us? Uh, it gets into self-regulation and it uses some of the zones of regulation to identify and give the kids the words um, to tell us how they're feeling. So it's not just a guessing game. And, and as adults, how valuable is that? If I'm a better communicator about my own emotions and my own feelings, I just think that opens up the world to to being able to get along well with others and really empower others to display the empathy that we were talking about earlier. If I know how you're feeling, I can respond to that. And if you can tell me how you're feeling, I can respond with empathy and really, really build our relationship to a, to a better place. So as adults, ultra important book as a teacher, uh, even more ultra. Um, but it's just, it was an <laughs> incredible book. Yeah. So that's a recommendation. Mark Brackett's permission to feel go check it out for sure. I, uh, I like how he says it in the book too, but an emotional detective. And, and I think that when we think about our journey in education, 
related to social emotional learning, we may we maybe start out as like private investigators, you know, we're we're not this detective yet. So how has that journey looked for you starting when you first came in? I know that you said you're trying to keep keep your head above water, just like any new teacher is, just trying to learn curriculum. Um, but then that growth that you've made in in how to get kids to talk about their feelings and, and how to regulate those really big feelings that they feel because because it is a bit of a journey to move from a first year teacher to a veteran teacher and learn all these things. So how how has that gone for you? Was it was it easy? Was it you know how how did how did you move down that road? Um man, I think one of the best the biggest realizations that I've ever had professionally is that kids are going to take your time whether they take it by stealing it or you give it to them by your own free will, right? And so if I give my time to students by listening, by showing I care, by, by socializing with them, by doing things that they value, making TikToks or playing with them at recess, I'm giving them my time. I can build those relationships. I can understand where they're coming from emotionally. Um, if I choose not to give them my time, then they're gonna take it. The behaviors will be there. You'll have to stop class and correct things. Um, and sometimes if we don't uh, stop things when they need to be stopped, those big, huge emotions then become the big, huge issues where the whole, whole room has to be cleared, right? And so yeah. I think it's really important that even as a first-year teacher, maybe you start being reflective and just, just really think about, am I giving my time or are kids taking time? And I think that, that really was a, a transition for me when I started saying, hey, my time will be given to students one way or the other. How, how do I want it to be given? You know? Man, that's a great way to think about it. That's powerful too. Think about it. They're, they're, they're going to get your time no matter what, make it a, make it a positive way that they're going to get it. Yeah, um, definitely. Um, so tell us a little bit more about, your journey into education, Josh, what made you want to, I know we're going kind of going the back the other way, but what made you decide that teaching kids being in school for the rest of your life was what you wanted to do? So I, I, I touched on Tom Henry, my, my fourth grade teacher who I now teach with, uh, man, beyond that, I mean, from, from his class, I knew, Hey, this is what I want to do. Um, moving, Moving down the road into, into high school and college, there were times that I thought about other things, but I still had it in my heart to, to be a teacher. Um, so, man, I, I don't have this, like, I don't have this super elaborate story about how, how I came to want to be a teacher because it's, it's just been with me since I was a kid, but it's because of another teacher. Uh, staying in education, though, that's a little bit of a different story because you know once you get in you're talking about keeping that feet churning in the swimming pool keeping your head up sometimes you feel like you're dipping down um and refining that spark i think is is one of those hard things that teachers feel um how do i how do i get inspired with my job how do i fall in love with my job again i mean we go to we go to counseling for for marriage we go to counseling for all these different things and and then there's there's nothing for teachers when they start to feel that burnout. Um, so so one thing that I've really done, and it goes back to exactly what you're saying, investing in your kids, is I was getting burnt out my first year because my time wasn't with kids the way that I wanted it to be. And so after my first year teaching, I I had some deep reflecting to do, and I thought, what do I need to change? And and I started going to kids' games. I started communicating with parents a lot more. I made it a partnership instead of just a, me and the student at school and the student and parents at home. It became a team thing. Uh, and I think, I think that that's what's kept me in is exactly what you were saying, making sure that my time is invested the right way in kids. Uh, what about you, though? Because, I mean, I feel like when I, when I say my – my whole life I've known I've wanted to be a teacher. Do you have something throughout your life that, that turned you towards teaching? Um, I want to make a huge confession right now. 
and <laughs> those <laughs> dangerous. Be awesome. <laughs> it's dangerous. Um, I wasn't the best student. I was probably a student who was choosing where I was going to put my time and it wasn't the places it should have been. And um, I loved school. I absolutely loved school. Um, and my teacher loved me, thankfully, but it wasn't for the math and the reading and the writing. It was because my friends Bo and Timmy were there and Bo and Timmy and I happened to get into quite a bit of trouble. And so, um, <laughs> and so, so I, I've loved school. <clears throat> um, and I went into college not thinking about education at all. I wanted to be an occupational therapist and I was in a program where I would have gone to a university here and been a, an occupational therapist, but I got into biology and a lot of studying and it just didn't seem like a natural fit. So I thought to myself, what in the world have I done in my life that I've really enjoyed, right? And this, maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but like I had a job as a swim teacher and I love to be able to take a kid who couldn't swim, who didn't, was afraid of the water, get him into the water, get him swimming. And for some reason, it just really was incredible to see this kid grow from being afraid of the water, not being able to swim to, being able to do the breaststroke or butterfly, right? And that was super rewarding. And, uh, you know, it just really turned me on to that. So when I went to uh, my advisor and said, hey, I want out of the science department, I want out of this program, I want to go be a teacher. He looked at me and said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I want to do this. Would you please sign my release? And I'll go over to my other advisor in the education department. And he said, okay. And he signed off on it. And it's the best decision I've ever made. And it is, without a doubt, the profession that, that I was made for. So that's my journey into, into education. And it's, it's got to feel great, too, um, just having that happiness every day when you get to go to work. I remember, you know, hearing about, why do you want to grow up? Then you have to work the rest of your life. But, man, when you love what you do, it's awesome. Oh, Mondays, yeah. Mondays aren't always the easiest but they're definitely not the garfield mondays <laughs> right right yeah it's fun. it's fun to get to go to work and you don't do the same thing every single day no there's not there's not that monotony man mm -hmm. it's a great feeling it is. i had that i kind of had that feeling you're talking about like not liking what you were doing i this this isn't super man you have you like to do let it out josh Man, I worked, I worked at Sonic and the whole time I worked there, I was like, man, I can't, I can't, I can't work when I get older. I can't do this. I just, I just want to stay in school. So I love how you're talking about, you know, you just feel happy when you wake up and get to go to a job that you love. Just totally incredible. Totally incredible. Um, so we, we've been through this dip, like it's no secret COVID's here. It's a real thing. And um, man, I remember when we, um, when we first got word that we were going 100% remote. And I've never felt this in my life ever before or since, but I really felt incapable, like totally inept, like totally ill-prepared. And uh -huh. I couldn't make lesson plans because I didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around what that looked like for my community of learners. Right. Tell, tell me about how you felt when you thought we were going into, when you found out we were going into crisis learning. Man, you, you're going to remember this just like I, it's like one of those moments in your life that you remember exactly where you were when it happened, like, like 9-11, but March 11th, we're getting ready to leave on Thursday, Friday, the last day before spring break, and we figure out there's not going to be any school tomorrow on Friday, and at that time, I'm thinking we're going to have spring break and maybe one more week off just to get everything figured out, and then, you know, the week after spring break turns into the next month. And then we figure out we're not coming back at all. Yeah. You just feel helpless because as you, you know, we weren't, we weren't prepared for that. And that's why I call it crisis learning. It's not distance. It's not remote. It's Holy cow. What are we going to do? We got to figure something out. Mm -hmm. But it was, you were right. Exactly what you said. I felt incapable. I felt hopeless. I didn't, I felt overwhelmed. I still feel overwhelmed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I've got, I've got 19 kids this year and 17 are in person, but I feel, I feel overwhelmed by all that. I'm so happy that we're back in school, but 
man, when that, when we were fully remote, not coming back, you could see it in the kids too. The day that, mm. the day that Rickett said school, schools aren't coming back this school year. And I had to walk in to our morning meeting. I, so I still went up to school um, during crisis learning because I've got two kids and I wouldn't be able to concentrate here. So I was, I was going up to school still. And I walk in, I did all of my Zoom meetings. Rickett is the governor. So Pete Rickett said, yeah, sorry. Our governor, sorry. No, no, our governor said, we're done. We're done. Yeah. So the day that I find out about that, I walk into our morning meeting. I just broke down. I looked at, mm. I might start crying now. I, I look at the, the 20 different faces on that screen. No one, some of you, I will never see in person again. I know that some of you are going to, I didn't tell them that, but I know, I know some of them are going to come back and visit. Um, but man, some of those kids I'll never, I'll never see again. They went to middle school. They moved away. They, it was, it was a heartbreaking moment. And it, not just for me, for every teacher, because there's teachers all over the place that didn't get that closure that the last day of school always brings. Yeah. So how did you stay inspired through this whole crisis learning, crisis teaching event? Because I think that's really important. You and I talked a little bit earlier about, um, man, it is tough. And you're going to have these lulls and these humdrums. And there, we love going to school. We love our job. But there's some days it's just like, oh man, you have a, you have a tough IEP or you have a tough, uh, you know, you have a tough conversation with a parent coming up or, um, you know, a coworker is just really slamming you for the way you did a lesson or the way you're not carrying out your responsibilities as a professional. Like, how do you stay, how do you stay positive? How do you, how do you stay um, inspired? Man, that's a great question. I, uh, just as a person, I naturally I'm happy most of the time, but you're right. There are times that we hit that, we hit that dip. Um, and it's important that, that we recognize when we're falling down into that hole, because that's where we start to see that burnout or start to see those big feelings of anger, or sadness. Uh, so I like to, I like to play basketball, honestly. Um, and before COVID I was playing three or four times a, a week. And that was, that was kind of my way to, stay in shape now I gotta run and I <laughs> hate that man I don't hats off to marathon runners I've ran a couple half marathons I've hated all 13.1 miles but uh I do a lot of reading um man I hang out with my family that's a that's a big part my my wife and my kids bring a lot of happiness to me and they they help lift me up my wife is probably the best listener I've ever met I mean she has to get annoyed listening to all my stories or when I come home and I'm upset about something but she sits there and listens and sometimes gives me advice and sometimes just understands that I need to vent for a second and then I'll be all right so I think I think having that support group there and making sure that you have something that you can turn to when you're feeling in that dip that's a big part of how how we can stay inspired and how we keep ourselves from falling too deep um, yeah. That's awesome. What about you though? I, you're a biker, aren't you? You know, I love to get out on the mountain trails, uh, mountain trails. I live in Nebraska, so there aren't a lot of, <laughs> go to the I, bluff. I, like, I, <laughs> we'll go over the hills. Um, I do love to bike. So I'll get out on my mountain bike and I'll take the kids out on bike rides. Um, I love to go to the gym. Um, but I think like one thing that does it for me is just realizing that um, there's this whole network of really inspirational teachers, like ultra inspirational teachers like you, like some other teachers we'll meet on here. But um, my gosh, what a just a bunch of go getters. They stay positive. Um, they realize, like you said, they realize their emotions. This book Inspire actually says that you can find inspiration every single day if you want but that you have to realize that it's like a muscle, right? So you find what inspires you. And this book is amazing. It goes through like, I don't know, maybe six different lists of inspiration that ways that you could be inspired. And then you, you know what inspires you and you just keep going back to it. Every time you feel yourself going into that humdrum or that lull or that dip or that valley. And um, you know, it's amazing. I, I find like, 
physical activity is one of my huge ones, right? So if I am feeling in that low, I might have to take an extra workout, you know, or go extra long or extra hard on my workout or whatever. Some people, it's just getting away into nature. For some people, it is relationships, you know, but it's just whatever inspires you, you need to do more of. And, and it's yeah. self-care, it's making that time. But um, that Inspire book was one of the big, big aha moments for me. Like, yeah, that totally makes sense. I need to take more time and buy them. Yeah, I think that's absolutely huge as professionals. We realize that we're going into that and then do what we need to do to, to get back energized. Right, and, we, and that's what we preach to our kids when we talk about regulating emotions. It's, it's important that we practice that as well. Um, and I think that having those conversations with kids is pretty powerful too. It's all about being real and being authentic. And kids, one reason I love my job, Josh, is because kids, I think, are – sometimes way smarter than adults. They cut through all the garbage like super fast, right? And, yeah. and whether you're pulling, pulling a quick one on them or not. So, um, and they'll let you know. Oh, absolutely. You know they will. And so I love the fact that you can be authentic with kids and they honor that some, sometimes more than adults. What do you think the most important issue facing public education or, or just educators in general today is? Man, um... That's a fantastic question. I think probably one of the most pressing things is the idea of self-care. And, and Sydney Jensen, the Nebraska Teacher of the Year from, I think it was either 2018 or 2019, has an amazing TED Talks on that. But I think teachers realizing that um, they're it. Like, you have to take care of yourself, no matter how many remote lesson plans you have. No matter, how, no matter how much grading you have to do because of the remote lesson plans, no matter how many emails are sitting on your phone, or maybe you disconnect your phone from your school email for a month or two, if you can. Like, I think that would be, right now, the biggest, biggest concern. We have worries about COVID. We have worries about going back to school or not. We have worries about commute. I was just reading from a teacher from North Dakota about how people are really, really emotionally charged about masks and how the, the teachers are feeling attacked because they, they don't want to have school if they can't be masked, right? Like, um, I, I think just teachers taking care of teachers of themselves is, is huge for right now, you know? Yeah. Uh, I never heard much about self-care in the education field until that TED Talk. And then it blew up. And when I think back on that, man, if we, if we would talk about things like that, it wouldn't take, and, and I love that she put that out. I think that it's important that we hear that, but does it need to get to that point? I wish, I wish that we could get some of that stuff that you're talking about out to people to understand, hey, we're all going through this stuff. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about how can we relight that spark? How can, how can we stay out of that, that valley? Yeah, uh, I think that that's something that educators are always really good at sharing ideas with one another. But I think opening up is something we got to get a little bit better at. Um, Horrible, yeah. Trust, you know, not not just seeing everybody as a coworker or a colleague, but being able to confide in somebody about how you're feeling and about the struggles because you know you're not alone when when you're having that feeling. So yeah. For sure. I agree. That is, that is a, a huge thing that we're facing. Sure. Um, Josh, if you could narrow everything down to one succinct thought about what the world needs now. Well, let me, let me say this. Let me say this. The whole <laughs> idea of, of what the world needs now comes from this, this old song, oldie but goodie, is what the world needs now is love, sweet love, Right. Right. Yeah, we've got enough mountains to climb. We've got enough oceans to cross. Um, and I think in education, we have enough assessments. We have enough worries. We have enough frets. We have, you know, enough stress. But in education right now, Josh, what does the world need now? And how do we say it better than the song? But, uh... <laughs> right. It's going to be going in your head all night now. Yeah, no kidding. Um, man, I think, 
I think what we keep coming back to is that inspiration. I think we we got to find ways to to inspire teachers, to inspire kids, to inspire inspire communities. I think I think that if we can if we can inspire in our jobs, the world's going to change for the better. Um, so I guess if I had to if I had to go with one word, I'm going to go I'm going to go with inspire. And I think that that's kind of the theme that we've been hitting on all night. I don't know. You got, you got something. I agree. I, I, I love the word inspire. I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. I'm going to go a different direction and say, I think what the world needs now is empathy. And I think the world, I, need, that. I think the world needs empathy because I need to understand that you're feeling that you need inspiration and I need to honor that. And I need to feel that I need, I need to understand that maybe a student needs a little bit of grace because it was a rough night last night. And I need to empathize with that student. And I need to understand that maybe a parent is really upset because I didn't notify them of a spelling test um, in the amount of time that they thought was appropriate. And so instead of being defensive, I need to empathize with that parent and understand their perspective. And I think that if we as educators could um, demonstrate empathy and show empathy, then maybe those around us, the, the presidential candidates and other people when they get older, this, this generation of children and maybe even us when we get a little bit older too, would be more empathetic. And, and I think that's what the world needs now. So Right on. That's a great one too. Man, <sighs> empathy, empathy is probably – in my top five for all time best words. Is it? I love it. You, you are right on. The world can't ever have enough of that. Or inspiration. I think, we're, I think we solved the world's problems for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Oh, 